I'm Sarah Bivens. And I'm Matthew Bivens. We had a home birth back in 2016. So we started a podcast about it. And then grew it into a birth brand to help future and current parents believe in their success with home birth. This is the place to hear home birth stories along with helpful resources and tips to feel empowered and supported in your birth journey. This is Doing It At Home. Hi team, welcome back to Doing It At Home. I'm Sarah, my co-host is Matthew. This is the podcast all about home birth. We love home birth. We had a home birth back in 2016 and here we are still talking about it because we love it so much. Today's episode is the hybrid of medical and midwifery, talking breach and twin home births with Dr. Stu Fishbein. Yes, you heard me. And if you know who Dr. Stu is, then you are as excited as I am. I pretty much can't contain myself. I'm so excited for this conversation. And you all made it happen, really. So we put out a post on social media a while back, I think, asking what you'd like to see, hear from on the show, just what you want. What can we do for you? And one of the requests was to have Dr. Stu on the podcast, which I was all on board for and so put it out there and I think I tagged him in a post and he said, sure, when are we doing it? And here we are. And now we have this conversation. So I just love how that happens. So I love that magical co-creation and how you helped bring this to fruition. So thank you. Thank you, community. You rock. You're amazing. And we all get to benefit now from this conversation because it is a powerful one. And you can watch the interview as well on our YouTube channel. So we did a video call with Dr. Stu. So you can listen to it here or you can hit pause right now, hop over to the YouTube channel and watch it or listen to this whole thing and then go watch it because there's something about the facial expression, the being in connection and seeing a person share, especially a a person like Dr. Stu, who is as passionate as he is about the topics at hand here. And uh, I just, I can't say enough about how excited I am to share this conversation. We talk a lot about normalizing breach and twin home births because that's kind of Dr. Stu's bag. That's a lot of what he does and a lot of the families that he supports, families that would have otherwise been hospital births or even just gone straight to cesarean, but he's able to support them and provide the care to normalize the experience and have an out of hospital birth. So we talk about that. We talk about relative risk versus actual risk in terms of birth. We talk about the midwifery model of care. We talked about we talk about why a lot of doctors fear birth and the medicalized birth system. And then we had some questions from the community for Dr. Stu. So he was gracious enough to answer some of our community member questions. And, you know, they say don't meet your heroes, but I don't think that includes meeting your birth world heroes, because I think we should all definitely meet our birth world heroes. And so it was very personally fulfilling for myself and Matthew to meet and connect and chat with Dr. Stu. And I'm just so excited to bring him into the doing it at home space and for all of you to enjoy as well. So quick word from our sponsor, and then we talk with the Dr. Stu. Hi, Dr. Stu. Welcome to doing it at home. Hi, Sarah. (laughs) <laughs> Hi, Matthew. Hello, Thanks hello. For me. Absolutely. Um, I, 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 I loved listening to your last podcast, and I, and I love the title of your podcast too, because you can, it has double entendre or maybe even triple entendre. So that's what's really great. <laughs> yes, it. intentionally so. Yes, yes. Mm-hmm. Well, we're super excited to have you on the show today. So thank you so much for your time. You are so welcome. It's fun for me to, uh, to talk to other people around the country that I haven't got a chance to talk to, and. You know, for the three people who don't know who I am, um, I, I'm, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> there's, a, there's a lot of people who don't know who I am, especially outside of Southern California. Um, but I am doing my best to, in my own little way, to spread information, not misinformation, but accurate information uh, on what's going on in the birth world. Mm-hmm. Well, that's exactly why we wanted to have you on the podcast and just to talk about these things, because the topics we're going to dig into today, there's a lot of information that people are lacking. Yep. There might be some misinformation going around, and you're just an amazing authority in this area. So, yeah, let's dig in. Yeah. So a couple of the key things that you can speak to and that you're pretty well known for are home births for breach and twin births. Um 
a lot of times those situations don't happen outside of the hospital. So for some, it's like an automatic trip to the hospital when that is a, a component of their pregnancy and birth experience. So you can very much speak to what is possible for those scenarios in terms of out of hospital births. Um, and so I wanted to start with, we could kind of break them into the two so that we don't cross over. Let's look at breach for a second. Breach births. What are the main fears or concerns about a breach birth that that has it that they're, they're not commonly thought to happen outside of the hospital? Well, two things first. Uh, when you say that people who have breached their twins need to end up going to the hospital, um, even at the hospital, their choices are extremely limited, and mm -hmm. most people will end up with a cesarean section. So in order for me to talk to people who already have that sort of confirmation bias, and so I would ask them to step outside of themselves for a little bit and, and maybe think that the system that we have taking care of pregnant women in Western countries, specifically the United States, even though it's been in place for a long time, is not functioning well and is not the ideal situation. It's entrenched for, for many reasons, whether they be economic, expedient, ego, medical, legal, um, but the whole system needs to be re redone when it comes to birth because, and if we think in outside of our little box, we may be able to see a different picture. People who sit in their little box and do whatever they've been told all their lives or what they've been taught in medical school or residency, you're, it's really gonna be difficult to ever get them to stop for a second and change their mind when they hear some of the things that people like me have to say because we do not look at birth in our model, which is essentially I'm a hybrid of the medical and the midwifery model, but we don't look at birth as a illness or as a disease. And we look at variations of things like breach, which is three to 4% of all term pregnancies and twins, which is about uh, one in 30, one in 35, one in 40. So it's not even that income. That's almost 3%, two, two to 3% of all babies born, born are twins. And so we're considering six to 7% of all babies being born as being a, a disease process or abnormal. And we even look at head down singleton babies in the medical model as illness. By the very nature that we call them patients and we bring them to a hospital and a hospital in everybody's mind is a place you go when you are- Sick. Yep. Yeah. Sick. Yeah. You don't go to the hospital when you're well. So immediately we put women in the, in the mindset of, I have to give birth in a hospital, therefore I'm sick, and therefore I need to be treated, and therefore I may or may not be allowed to do things, and therefore this whole process needs to be interfered with, as if nature doesn't know what it's doing with human beings, yet in every other species we don't do any of the things that we're doing to the human female mammal. And so if we, if we try, if we stay in our little boxes and, and people listen to what I'm saying, it's just going to be like, uh, like the piano teacher in, in peanuts. It's going to be, <laughs> you know, but, um, it's, that's, what's going to be. It's not going to be, so people aren't going to hear me. So I'm asking people to just take a moment to step out of the box and listen carefully to the fact that up until, a, up until the last. 30 or 40 years, breach delivery was considered a variation of normal. Mm. It was routinely taught as part of the um, mainstream skills of obstetricians. Uh, and uh, I would argue intensely that any obstetrician that isn't trained in breach delivery should first of all, sue their residency program. But secondly, can really not call themselves an obstetrician because the things that might make my profession unique are those skills that no other profession has, mm. all right? Doing a C-section does not make you an obstetrician. And doing a pap smear does not make you an obstetrician. But doing a forceps delivery, pulling out a breech second twin, um, maybe doing a procedure on a woman's cervix or vaginal surgery or something, that makes you an obstetrician because most other specialties can't do those sorts of things. So I have a real problem with not only the system as it is, but the people who run the system, they're, they're propagating it 
a way that is going to be self-destructive to the, the to itself. They don't see it because they're inside it. And um, the future for most women when it comes to pregnancy is going to be midwifery. It needs to come back. Uh, midwives are experts in normal birthing. 80 to 90% of women are normal when they're in labor. They don't have a problem. And yet they all go to where you're being treated as a patient. Having that as a background, we can then go and I can answer your questions more about breach delivery and why I do what I do. Uh, partly because I'm trained to do breach delivery. When I was resident, I was lucky. I was at a facility where I got the um, training to do it. And if you don't get trained when you're a resident, um, you're not gonna come out suddenly and start doing something. It's just not, in the Western world, the, the climate is such that you can't practice on people when they're paying you and when there's liability and when there's malpractice and stuff. So you need to learn these skills when you're um, sort of protected. You have a little window of protection in medical school and residency where you could learn these skills. Um, but most breach deliveries are easy and uh, no, real di no real difference than uh, head down babies. Mm. Breach babies, when you understand it, they have cardinal movements. They do the things that they're supposed to do. You can watch it happen. You can often deliver babies without even touching them. Um, sometimes they need help and that's where the skill set needs to come into place. But to consider breach babies to be dangerous, which is what mainstream medicine tells pretty much every pregnant woman who has a breech baby, you need to have a version, and if the version isn't successful, we'll schedule your C-section. Mm -hmm. That's what they tell them. Yeah. We tell people that a version is an option, but if your baby stays breached, that's fine. As long as it meets the certain criteria that we used and that are universally agreed upon by breach practitioners around the world, um, breach delivery is actually quite safe. Mm -hmm. And even the um, colleges and organizations that represent doctors around the country, like around the world, like the American College of OBGYN or the Royal College of OBGYN or the Australia, New Zealand College of OBGYN all support breach delivery in properly skilled hands, but they all say that finding skilled hands is going to be uh, less and less uh, easy to do because of diminishing expertise. And therefore everybody's gonna end up with a C-section, but they never do anything about the diminishing expertise. Wow. But they all support it. And the risks are such that they're really quite small, whether you have a C-section for a breach or a vaginal delivery for a breach or a head down vaginal delivery. They're, they're, they're really no different. And if you want me to get into the weeds, I'll be happy to spew out a few really relevant statistics, but I just don't know your audience that well. So I don't know if I wanna go off in that tangent. Well, before we go into the tangent, cause we might wanna go there. I am curious for the the mom listening who, you know, is being told, mm. hey, you you your baby's breech, and that means that you have very few options. Here's what we need to do. But they're saying to themselves, no, I don't believe that. I don't buy that. What advice do you give for them when they're trying to find somebody, those skilled hands who are, you know, people who are skilled at breach, but they're just having a hard time finding them? Well, they're they're hard to find, but every community has generally somebody, or even if you have to travel for a second opinion, you know, an honest, an honest doctor, an ethical doctor can say to a woman, you know, I'm not comfortable with breach delivery. All right. And maybe I've even seen a bad outcome with a breach delivery, but there, but breach delivery itself is not that risky. I just don't know how to do it. There are people in the community that know how to do it. Why don't you go have a talk with them and then come back and we'll, and we'll discuss it as opposed to saying to them, well, breech babies, you know, they die at a high rate, their heads get stuck, the baby will have brain damage, the cord will fall out, you know, all the things that people throw out, yeah. you know, uh, to justify their position. There's sort of a, a cognitive dissonance on their part because nobody wants to be accused of doing things that are unnecessary. And if you, all your career, you've been saying C-sections for breach are, are necessary because it's dangerous, you're not going to be studying the literature or honoring the literature that's, that that dis disproves your position because it's really uncomfortable for people to have their foundation rock. And so they'll ridicule somebody who supports breach or they'll ignore the data or they'll cherry pick their data that supports the C-section for breach. And there is data for that too. But ultimately in the model that you and I advocate for, 
is the informed consent model. It's not my decision to tell you what to do. It's my decision to try to give you the best information with as unbiased a, a manner as possible, fully aware of the fact that you can never be completely unbiased. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a great point. So what were some of those weeds if we were to just maybe not go thigh high in them, but like knee high in some of those weeds? <laughs> well, let's talk about the danger thing that all babies should be born by cesarean section. The mm-hmm. best numbers to discuss the risks Okay, and this is a thing that I advocate for on just about every time I'm on a podcast or I give a lecture, I talk about the difference between relative risk and actual risk. Mm -hmm. And relative risk has no meaning whatsoever if you do not know what the denominator is. Okay, for instance, if something happened once in California last year, the incidence would be one in 40 million. And say this year it happened 10 times. You could say something has a tenfold relative risk to last year but the actual risk is still one in 4 million. Yeah. yeah. So this is, it depends how, how you present data. And this is the problem with papers and what I call um, research by press release. When the paper comes out and there's a headline about it and the, the facts of the paper are obscured. And then you read the paper and you read this material and method section, which is the most boring part of a paper, but it's actually got the meat of it in it. And it says, well, yeah, we came to this conclusion, but there were 12 people in our study. Yeah. So you need to know these numbers. So with breech delivery, the Royal College has the best average numbers. And the risk for a, a stillbirth with a term breach done by elective scheduled cesarean section is about one in 2000. And the risk of a term breach delivered vaginally with a, to end up in a stillbirth is one in 500. Mm. So you're talking about a fourfold risk Uh, delivering vaginally. But it's really unfair for two reasons. It's unfair to compare a vaginal breech birth, which is not standardized, which allows women to go to 40 weeks, 41 weeks, 42 weeks, versus a scheduled, well-standardized methodology of doing a scheduled C-section at 39 weeks. With the breech, you don't know the skill of the practitioner. You don't know what was planned or unplanned. There's a lot of things you don't know. So even, but even taking those numbers as, as gospel, it's really better to compare the risk of a vaginal breech birth to a vaginal head down birth. That makes much more sense. And the risk of a stillbirth with a vaginal head down birth rounds out to be about one in a thousand. Mm. So breech is about twice as risky as that. But if you look at the actual risk, the risk of a stillbirth with a uh, C-section for breech scheduled the risk of a death not happening is 99.95%. The risk of it not happening with a breech birth vaginally is 99.8%. And with a head down birth, it's 99.9%. So if you tell somebody they have a 99.8% chance of not having this terrible outcome that everybody's worried about, and it's not about injuries. Babies have injuries at a small rate, no matter how you deliver them. Some of the worst injuries to breech babies in the term breech trial, which was this paper, which I hope we don't get into, but which was sort of the thing that codified the initial um, view that C-section was better. Mm. Some of the worst injuries in their study came from breeches born at cesarean section, Mm -hmm. because when a breech is born at cesarean section, it's still being born breech. And people need to know the maneuvers to do it. And a lot of people don't know the maneuvers Mm -hmm. and they just pull and pull and pull and pull. And they end up with a neck injury or a brachial plexus injury, which is a shoulder injury, that sort of thing. So these things can happen with all births, but the death rate, you ask somebody what's the difference between 99.8 and 99.9 or 95, and they're going to say, well, not much. Yeah. But if you present it the other way, because you don't want them to choose breach, then you're, you know, you're not being dishonest, but you're being sort of deceitful. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That bias. That makes sense. Yes. Absolutely. Wow. So it, the real challenge, it, it seems like, is to your point of the skills being acquired by these practitioners. And so it's that there are a number of OBGYNs coming out of the box, not equipped to deal with that sort of variation of normal and therefore got to cover the butts and not not have any liability, as, as mentioned. So we're just not even going to go there because, frankly, I'm not skilled in it and I just don't want to deal with any of the potential repercussions. Correct. And I don't blame them. Right. 
I blame the I blame the the maternal fetal medicine physicians who run the obstetrical residency programs mm -hmm. for not teaching it because maybe they've been taught that it's dangerous. Who knows? I mean, people my age or my vintage and older are are, are you know we're retiring. We're as Elliot Berlin likes to say in our documentary, "Heads up, um, we're dying off." Mm -hmm. So, uh, which is true. So what's what's Sad for me is that people who train when I train, even in trained in my program, in the years that I was at Cedar Sinai in Los Angeles, where I learned breach and they all learned breach, most of them are not doing breach either. Mm -hmm. And it's not because they don't know how. It's for other reasons. It's for reimbursement reasons. It's for expediency reasons. It's easier to schedule a C-section at 7:30 in the morning on a Tuesday than it is to be waiting around and waiting around for this woman to go into labor have everybody around you nervous. And then because the hospital has a policy that says, if you have a breach in labor, Dr. Stu, you have to be here. And so you end up being at the hospital for 10 hours, 15 hours. You get paid no more from Blue Cross or Blue Shield than if you were there for 45 minutes. So yeah. all the incentives are wrong. Mm -hmm. Yeah, The system is wrong. And the success rates are worse. Even if you have a breach delivery in a hospital, just like if you have a head down baby in a hospital, your, your chance of having an unmedicated successful vaginal birth or even a medicated successful vaginal birth are going to be less than if you have that same labor in a, in a freestanding birth center or your home where the medical model does not interfere with the mammalian birth model and allows women to labor as nature intended. Mm -hmm. Something you mentioned earlier, I thought was really interesting that you see the future of, of birth being going back to that mid, midwifery model. How does that happen? It seems like so many things are set up just to continue to be in the institution of hospitals and, and, and that model. How do we bring more awareness to, the, to, to midwives and the work that they do and more awareness towards allowing nature to do what it does? Well, you're doing it right now, and I'm doing it. And I try to do it every day, even if it's just one family at a time. Yeah. Um, because the, de the demand is going to have to come from the women of, of our country yeah. to demand something different. I mean, if we were going in, if we were, if we were on an airline, if we were flying on an airline and 30% of the time something got screwed up and not a crash, but something got screwed up and it was a, or even even higher percentage of dissatisfaction. How long would that airline stay in existence? All right, yeah. it wouldn't stay in existence very long. But this is a monopoly on the system. They have ninety eight to ninety nine percent of births in the country are being done in the hospital, and about ninety three to ninety four percent are being done by obstetricians instead of midwives. You know, some hospitals will have CNMs, and that's a better that's a step in the right direction. Many CNMs are want to do the right thing, but they're in a model where they're, they're over, they're over uh, watched by regulation or by policy or by algorithms that they themselves have to follow, which mm -hmm. goes sort of against their midwifery instincts, but they're stuck in a hospital system where if they don't follow them, they're going to get fired. So they, they need to do what they, what the hospital wants them to do. But even in a hospital setting, your chance of a successful vaginal birth is going to be better in a midwifery model. And that's simply because the midwives tend to you, you develop a relationship with them. They don't interfere with your, um, your labor as much because they understand the mammalian model and they want to allow people to, to get up, to move, to eat, to um, not be interrupted, uh, those sorts of things which make labor run smoother. In the medical model, there's too many things that have to be done from the moment you walk or the moment you get in your car to drive to the hospital um, and check in through the emergency room or whatever it is, you're, you're feeling like a patient, pee in a cup, change in a gown, yeah. get a wristband, answer questions, mm -hmm. um, have a popsicle, um, get strapped with monitors. I mean, how is it that we at home have really um, amazingly good outcomes overall with a low risk population? And the same low risk population in the hospital has to be monitored continuously because something might go wrong. Yeah. And that leads to all the cascade of interventions, which you so eloquently mentioned um, in other of your, your podcasts. And, we, and everybody seems to know what that means, where one thing leads to another thing leads to another thing leads to 
baby decompensating an emergency C-section and the comment of, wow, this was, we were lucky we had an OR here because yeah. what would yeah. you have done if this had happened at home, which shows an absolute ignorance yeah. of the model of care we have at home, which means that we don't see these things happen, but very, very rarely. Mm -hmm. And so, yes, we don't have an operating room nearby, but yes, we have better outcomes. We have lower intervention rates, lower C-section rates, much higher satisfaction rates. And that, that includes my addition to the midwifery model, which is a hybrid, of course, because in my state up until 2014, midwives could do breaches and they could do twins. Mm. And then the legislature took it away. Mm -hmm. And they took it away because they were lobbied by who? Obstetricians mm -hmm. to take it away. Why are obstetricians even having a say in what midwives do? And yeah. it's because of the, again, it gets back to the system and the way we think that midwifery is a lesser subset of obstetrics as opposed to its own profession. Mm -hmm. Midwifery should be governed by midwives and, it, and there should be, a, 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 and there shouldn't be career midwives either. There should be rotation. We should never have, we shouldn't have career politicians. We shouldn't have career anything mm -hmm. because people get comfortable in their role and then they forget where they came from. Yeah. yeah. But we should have midwives who are deciding what's, reasonable for midwives to do, mm -hmm. as opposed to doctors who have a conf an absolute conflict of interest right. in regulating what midwives can do. Because if it gets out there that midwives are, are universally available and can practice wherever they want, and even in a hospital, my profession is going to, the, the, op the obsolete uh, onslaught of my profession will be increased. I've already told you that they're heading that way without teaching the skills that make my profession unique. So it's going to happen sooner or later, but it probably will be later because mm -hmm. they'll cling to it for a really long time. They'll cling to this model, which isn't working. Yes. Switching gears for a second on the topic of twin births. Is it similar to the scenario with breach that the training isn't there as much or the skill set isn't there as much? Or is there some other kind of unique factor that comes in with twin birth that has some people saying that's a higher risk? You should be in a hospital. Well, it, it, it is a slightly higher risk. The problem is the hospital isn't offering the options that they should offer. Okay. If they want women to deliver in the hospital with their twins, then they should offer them the ability to, do, to labor as we do at home, just in the hospital. But they can't because their risk managers and their nurse managers and their, their maternal fetal medicine academicians all consider this to be high risk. And they, and they plant seeds of doubt from the moment they find out that you're having twins. Mm -hmm. Saw a couple yesterday, they're 10 weeks pregnant. They were diagnosed at seven weeks with twins by their OB who told them that uh, we should be scheduling your C-section at 37 weeks. Mm. Wow. Just and he says this to her at, at seven weeks pregnant. Wow. Um, so that's a clear indication that this man has no intention of ever delivering these kids vaginally even if they were vertex, vertex, and she was a grand multip, mm -hmm. he would still section her. And this is, this is more common than not. I mean, there are still people that will deliver twins in the hospital. Some will even do it if the second twin is breech, but most won't. And almost nobody will do it when the first twin is breech. Mm -hmm. And yet the literature supports first twin breech vaginal delivery if proper, if proper selection criteria are met. Mm -hmm. But if you asked any obstetrician that or any woman that, they would say that that's not safe because that's just what they're told. And you repeat it over and over and over again by people that you supposedly trust. Why would, why would you not believe it? But I can tell you right now that my, my profession deserves the hit it's taking right now in the, in the, in the world regarding the trust of doctors in medicine, all regarding the um, coronavirus mm -hmm. misinformation that's out there. Um, because I wouldn't trust academic medicine right now, that they're, they're, they're doing everything they can to suppress alternative viewpoints. And that's sort of what I've been going through with for a long time. Mm -hmm. this is what's going on with the um, censorship and, and, and certain doctors afraid to speak out because they'll lose their funding or lose their job or whatever else, that's been going on in medicine for a really long time. It's now evident to everybody in the world that science is corrupted and medicine is corrupted. And it, it, it's corrupted in my profession as well. Um, so 
when, a, when a, somebody tells them that twins are dangerous, what are you doing? What are you, 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 you might as well plant a seed um, in the most fertile, a seed of doubt in the most fertile soil you can plant it in there because you've just taken a page right out of the movie Inception and tell, if I tell you not to think about elephants, yeah. all right? What do you think about? You think about elephants. So mm -hmm. if you think, of, if they start, to play, oh, you're 35. Oh, and you know, your husband, he's six foot four. You're only four foot 11. Um, there's no way that baby's going to fit out of your pelvis. And that's when you hear this stuff and you wonder, did they, are they making this up? Are they projecting their own fears onto, onto the women that they care for? That's my best assessment is that most doctors fear birth. And the best way for them to deal with that is to project their fear all around them. So they, they feel like justified and supported um, in their own fear. It's not a very good place to be. Um, birth is a natural process. It affects every person on earth. Mm -hmm. I mean, we were all born and many of us will have children, not everybody, but everybody was born. So everybody experienced that at some point. And I'm not saying you remember it, but I'm saying that, that what could be more important than how we give birth. And it is so far down the totem pole of social, um, uh, what do you call it? Social things that we, that, that we're addressing right now. Mm -hmm but it's probably the most important thing because we're not even talking about just the method of how you give birth, but it's the, it's the um, hormonal milieu that a woman is putting out when she's pregnant, that's bathing her baby and his baby's neurons as they form and the epigenetics and the microbiome that you're creating for your baby, which then will, will be part of that baby and part of that baby's future and a part of all that baby's future children. Um, yeah, so I know that this is getting going, this is probably, Deck high weeds we've gone into, but it's important. <laughs> it it's is. important because again, it's it's not about breacher twins. I could talk about breacher twins and I could give you a lecture on and how they do it and how to choose and and people can find that other places. But it's it's we need to really rethink the obstetric model of care in our country because it's not doing well. In 50 years, we went from a C-section rate of five percent to a C-section rate of over 30%. And in many countries around the world, it's 60, 70, 80%. Greece, mm -hmm. South Africa, Brazil, um, crazy, crazy numbers. And the epigenetics of that are impossible to define. We don't really know what's gonna happen when babies have never experienced labor spontaneously. They don't, they don't know how to start labor in their mothers and their mo they don't experience their mother's hormonal uh, milieu while they're going through labor and then they come out and we don't know what that does. And I don't know that there's a really way to study that, but it would be really interesting. It'll be interesting to see what happens to babies 20, 30 years from now who were born when people were sitting there locked in their homes, uh, scared out of their mind because of a sort of a false pandemic. Mm -hmm. Not saying it was false. I'm just saying that the reaction to it was, was the problem, not the pandemic itself. Yeah. So... We don't know. We don't know what these things are, but maybe people are going nuts and maybe people are making really bad decisions now because we've had 50 years of bad laboring. Mm. I don't know. Huh. It's possible. Yeah. Who knows? It's crazy. <laughs> why is it? Why has it gotten so crazy? Yeah. That connection could totally be there. Why don't people think rationally? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And why don't people, why are people so set on their own opinion and so furious when they hear another opinion? Mm -hmm. Why not just debate it? Or why not say, well, I don't believe in that, but that, that's your right to have that opinion. And you do that, but that's not the way it is. If, when, a, when I have a family that, that, that wants to have a breach home birth and, and someone in their family, they share it with them. Sometimes they get good support, but most of the time they get, you know, you know what I'm talking about. I think you talked about it a little bit yeah. on your history. Absolutely. About, I think it was about Matthew's family was supportive. Your family yeah. was a little bit uh, not so supportive. Yeah. Right. Nuchal cord Why was my story. Nuchal cord. And so I, right. I wouldn't Why? have made it if I was born at home. That's what I was told. Mm -hmm. You wouldn't. Even, well, I'm sorry, you cut out. I was told I wouldn't have made it if I was born at home. Because oh yeah, of the that's right. Cord. Yeah, that's what you said. Yeah. Right. Yep. And that's what they believe, and it and it's too painful for them to believe anything else. Yeah. Here, here's a, here's an example that I use a lot about how painful it is for people to 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 look at reality and prefer cognitive dissonance. All right. We have a 30% cesarean section rate or higher in the United States. Let's use that as an example. 
there are about 1.4 million C-sections done in the United States every year. So if you do the math, that's 14, 20, what is that? That's uh, um, 500, 600, 700,000 um, no, excuse me, there's 4 million births. That's 1.4 million C-sections done in the United States. The World Health Organization and other institutions say the C-section rate should be about 15%, okay? Ours is 30%. So we're doing twice as many C-sections as the World Health Organization says is necessary. So that must mean that approximately half of all the C-sections we're doing are unnecessary, mm -hmm. which means it's about 700,000 unnecessary C-sections going on in the United States every year. Now, if we had 700,000 unnecessary mastectomies or knee surgeries or anything else, people would be furious and up in arms. So yeah. we don't have a peep from anybody in our leadership positions, whether it's in academia or in politics, that says anything about that. But here's the crazy part. If we do agree that the C-section rate is too high and that half of C-sections, for example, for this example, are unnecessary, who is doing all these unnecessary C-sections? Because nobody goes home at night and says, hey, honey, guess what? I did two unnecessary C-sections today. Mm -hmm. Every C-section that every doctor does, they believe is necessary, yet half are unnecessary. Therein lies the cognitive dissonance because you can't have both be true. Yeah. Period. And it's the same thing with breach. And it's the same thing with twins. Hmm. You know, why am I doing twins? Why are there several doctors around the town that are doing twins or breaches and having a very great success with it? How is that possible? Are we just are we just getting lucky every time? Right. Or is there something to it? And shouldn't that skill be something that the academia wants to teach the next generation of, re of residents? Because wouldn't that be better for the women of America to have people who are familiar with this procedure? Because some people are going to want it. Yeah. Some people are going to show up in the emergency room with an undiagnosed breach and the butt or the feet sticking out and nobody's going to know what to do. And how can you, I mean, as an obstetrician, all right, not being able to save that baby, not being able to save that woman would kill me if I didn't know the procedures. How do these residents finish residency program not angry with their professors mm -hmm. who for four years had the opportunity to teach them this and chose them not to, and then chose not to bring in outside people to teach them, like me or like Rick Safries and David Hayes with their Breach Without Borders um, thing. I mean, it may be starting, but it, it, it's way too slow. And at some point, um, it, it's going gonna, it's gonna to break out because the, the torchbearers of these skills are no longer the obstetricians. They are who? They are the midwives. Yeah. Because yeah. midwives want to learn these skills. Midwives know that they're going to be out in the, in the world. They need to know these skills, whether they're going to work in Beverly Hills at a home birth or in Togo or Haiti or someplace else where there's nobody to back them up. They need to know how to do it. Yeah. You know, doctors don't want to work in any facility that doesn't have NICU and anesthesia immediately available. As a matter of fact, that's one of the leading questions I get from, from medical colleagues of mine who say, well, you know, how do you do it without an epidural? How do you, how do the women do it? It's like, wow. They all do it. We have a zero epidural rate at home. Imagine that. <laughs> yeah, imagine that. Yeah. Again, it just sounds like so much back into the model that people are trained in and, and just, you know, are, are trained in and they walk into the hospitals now with that mentality and anything outside of it, it just doesn't, it does not compute. And there's the, the extreme pushback, like you were saying. And so, you know, I think that being able to have these conversations so so women and mothers to be can see this and then come forth with their own questions and mm -hmm. feel empowered to look for their own alternatives you know I, I believe that that's absolutely one way to do it and what do you say to when you have a mom to be who's in front of you who has been pumped with all these fears and yet there's a part of her that that just wants something different doesn't want to go that that route of you know all the interventions but Yet she's she's been told, oh well, you need to do this, you need to do that. How do you support that, mom? Well, that's good. I mean, I, I, I my initial consult with these people is between an hour and hour and a half long, and we go through all of their concerns, all of their history. Um, I then sort of regurgitate rele relevant literature. I honor I honor their anxieties and their fears. I don't 
tell them that that's crazy or whatever. Some on rare occasion when the doctor says something like at seven weeks you need a C-section that, you know, I, I, I can't even, I can't even hide my disdain for that. But yeah. for the most part, it's very professional. It's very casual. We sit there on a couch. I'm in a chair. My students are sitting next to me and they chime in. So it's sort of a group discussion. Um, I go through statistics with them. I offer them uh, references. I also offer them um, the ability to talk to other couples mm. who have waived confidentiality. I have what I call my breach moms list and my twins moms list. I even have my VBAC moms list. So for people who come in who've been told this or that, they'll think, and because a lot of women have gone through this. I mean, these people that are coming into my office, they're not the first ones to ever do this. So there's no, there's no point reinventing the wheel every time they come in. We have a yeah. really good model where other people have come before you and they have wisdom. Yeah. So let's take their wisdom and let's talk about it. And then let's talk about why physicians say the things that they do. And we go through that as well. And then I, I break it down. And by the time that most people leave my office, they, I'm not selling anything. Mm -hmm. I'm telling them, this is the information. I want you to take this information. I want you to think about what your, what your choices are. And I go through all the choices. And I talk about scheduled C-section for breach. Here's the pros and cons. C-section for breach, but waiting for labor. Here's the pros and cons. Uh, vaginal breach delivery. Uh, hospital. Vaginal breach delivery, home. Here's the pros and cons. And we go through them all. External cephalic version. Here's the pros and cons. A lot of people, when they find out that they can have a vaginal breach delivery, and the numbers are sort of what I told you, and the success rates are really high, especially if this is your second or third baby or beyond. Um, my success rate for multiparous women with a breach birth in the home setting is 100%. It won't be 100%. At some point, it won't be 100%. But after 11 years of doing breaches at home, multips, 100%. Primips, it's a little over 80%. All right. So even 80% of first time moms have a breach will have a successful breach at home. And of the 20% that go to the hospital, almost all of them will get a C section because nobody's willing to do what they would do with a head down baby, which is give them an epidural and pit. They will, they'll do a section. Although we just had one yeah. two days ago who, a lovely physician here in Los Angeles, I called him. The, photo the birth photographer said, why don't you call Barry Brock? And I said, yeah, I'll call Barry. I know him. Call Barry. And um, he said, sure, Sue, so I'll do it for you. I'll do it. And he took her on. And she was six, seven, six to seven centimeters for a long time at the birth center. At some point, she was getting exhausted. So we thought it would be best for her to go. So we got, so, so more than uh, 14 hours later, she had a spontaneous breach vaginal birth at the hospital. Mm. She had an epidural. She had Pitocin. But she had a... Uh, breach birth. That's an unusual story. Um, that's the way it should be. That's what smooth yeah. transition and collaboration yeah. should look like. Yeah. But, you know, unfortunately, there are no, there's only like one Barry Brock in all of Los Angeles. So it's very hard to find people. I'm saying his name repeatedly because, yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm, because I honor him. I mean, yeah. not everybody likes my bedside manner, his bedside manner. That's irrelevant. The fact that he did that and that this woman and this baby's life are changed forever yeah. um, because of him, people should know that. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Right. And then the naysayers and the trolls will come out and, they'll, and the haters and they'll come out, but that's okay. Yeah. Um, because anyway, so that's what I do for, for couples when they come in and, and most people, and then I go through the criteria that are used to de determine what it's safe. And these are international criteria. These are not Dr. Fishbein's criteria. These are, international criteria. I've modified it slightly for the home birth setting because there is no international criteria for home breach delivery because there is no data on home breach delivery. Yeah. So here's another piece of a piece of data is that when a doctor says that home delivery for breach is dangerous, they're lying. Right. Because there is no data on home breach delivery other than the little bit of data that I published because all other data on home breach delivery doesn't take into account the skill, like we said earlier, the skill of the practitioner, yeah. the, was it planned or unplanned? Was there a surprise breach? Did the, did they meet the criteria of a flexed head and estimated fetal weight and no gross anomalies and all the things that we use to determine whether this is a good choice? Was the baby in frank or complete or even an incomplete breach? Or was it, uh, was there a cord presenting? Was it a funic presentation? And did you have a bad outcome because you had a cord prolapse, which would have been known if this woman had been, um, <clears throat> seen beforehand and had an ultrasound to know 
that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. But all these are lumped in together and then they come out with these, this is dangerous mo um, model. Yeah. But again, we go back to the, the, the Royal College numbers and say it's still, it, uh, the lack of the, the possibility of a stillbirth for, with a twin pregnancy in labor, interpartum death is, is, uh, is one, in a, one in 500 or 99.8% chance of it not happening. Mm -hmm. So that's what I say to them. And they leave a lot more confident than when they left. Not everybody chooses to do it. Not everybody can afford it. Yeah. You know, in my model, we don't take insurance mm -hmm. because insurance doesn't pay enough to give us the, what we need to give the care and, and the time that we commit to these people. Because it's not like we're in a group practice where, you know, you may love your obstetrician, but you only have a one in six chance of that person being the one on call yeah. the night you're in labor. And then the people taking care of you primarily in labor in the hospital model, another problem with the hospital model is that it's a nurse that you've never met before. Yeah. And that nurse, you, you may end up loving that nurse, but then seven o'clock rolls around and she leaves. Yeah, she's out of there. And then another nurse comes on and you have to establish this all over again. And to quote Sarah Buckley, um, quiet, safe, and unobserved is the best way to labor for a mammal. And you feel feel safest when you feel that you are supported by a team that you know. Yes. That you get to pick the people that are going to be at your birth. And you don't, not a bunch of strangers walking in all the time right. because that's distracting. Sure is. Or I can imagine it would be. So we have some questions from our community that we compiled and collected because there were quite a few people really excited about this conversation. So um, yeah, I'm going to read them off and we'll see what Dr. Stu has to say. <laughs> so the first question is, what made you want to be an OB? Oh, okay. Um, I didn't. Okay. <laughs> um, Next question. <laughs> I was in college. I was, I always wanted to be like a marine biologist mm. or a uh, forest ranger because I was an outdoor person. I grew up in Minnesota. We were outside on the lakes all the time. We were up at the Boundary Waters, uh, canoeing, camping. I, I just love that sort of thing. But um, just to, to, to not belabor the question, when I went, when I was an undergrad, I didn't really know what I wanted to do. I was a biology major. I didn't know really what I wanted to do with it. But a bunch of my buddies, I'm Jewish. And you know, that's one of the things that Jewish mothers want their sons to become is physician. So let's, let's be honest. So my mother was sort of pushing that way. And I had a bunch of my buddies who were going pre-med. So I said, ah, I can do that. If they can do that, Greg can do that. If Lex can do that, I can do that. <laughs> so um, I uh, went pre-med and then I got into medical school. And then when you are a medical school, the first two years are pretty much classroom clinical stuff. The second two years you're, you're in the, in the, on the wards doing rotations. And I had just come off hematology oncology rotation in my third year. And it was very depressing to me. Um, it was medicine with children and uh, it was pediatric leukemia. And uh, I had some children die on my service and terrible seizures and fungal infections. It was pushing chemotherapy was not what I wanted to do. And then my next rotation just fortuitously happened to be OB. And so instead of being up at four in the morning pushing chemotherapy, I was up at four in the morning catching a baby. And I thought, wow, this is great. So that's sort of how I chose OB. Also, because the practice of, obstru of obstetrics is one of the few practices where you have what's called longitudinal care. In other words, you take care of people over time. Yeah. ER physicians treat somebody, they never see them again. A surgeon treats somebody, never see them again. Pathologists, radiologists, they don't even see patients. They, you know, they just look at things. So, but internists, pediatricians, family practice doctors, OBs, but OBs also got to do a little psychiatry, a little endocrinology, a little um, uh, surgery. And plus we got the happy thing about obstetrics involved along with oncology and, you know, and G1 urology and infertility and all that. But it was the obstetric part that really attracted me to it. And so that's what I chose. So I applied for obstetric residencies. It was, it, but I had no epiphany like a lot of my midwife colleagues who were six years old, they saw their sister being born and they mm. said, I want to do that. And yeah. I didn't have any of that sort of thing, no. Gotcha. Okay. But. Was there, if there was, what was the exact moment when you knew you couldn't practice in the hospital any longer? Oh, it was easy. Uh, the hospital was not going to renew my privileges. 
Um, they, they couldn't really kick me off staff because I hadn't done anything, but they didn't like the way we were practicing. They, they never did. We were practicing for 15 years as a collaborative midwifery doctor practice in Ventura County. And the hospital we were at always gave us hostility from the first day we even came there. And they always treated us differently. They, they uh, gaslit us, they gunny sacked us, they gave us sham peer review. They did things to try to make our life miserable. We had really good statistics. We had a collaborative care, the midwives took care of the low risk stuff. I took care of the high risk stuff. We had a C-section rate overall of 7%, which was one third of the, of the, of the rate of the next best group. And uh, we had a lot of people coming to us and other doctors there was a, it was a smaller community and there was a good old boy network. And I probably wasn't the easiest person to get along with because I was probably, and still am very confident in what I'm doing. And uh, I don't like people who treat you badly. So I probably would return with snarkiness. And, you know, I it hadn't learned to, my temperament uh, needed to be, um, calmed down a little bit in those days. And so I didn't have a lot of friends in the, in the medical executive committee or anything like that. And they just chose that not to renew my privileges. And so I had a choice of fighting them, which is an administrative process, which sucks mm. because you don't have an independent people judging you. You're judged by the same people that are accusing you. Wow. So you're probably going to lose and it's going to cost lots of money to do it. And then and then my, my attorney and some of my midwife friends said, listen, even if you fight them and win, what's going to happen is you're going to win to stay at a hospital. It's going to be trying to get you every time that you do something. So yeah. um, why would you want to stay there? So that's the epiphany. That was the thing that made it easy. They, they were going to terminate my privileges. So I had to do something else. And fortunately, because I had been working with midwives for 25 years, including taking their transports and being a backup, I knew everybody in the community. I knew all the midwives and they said, Stu, you got to come to some home births. And even after 20, after all those years of backing them, I was still like, I can't, I'm not going to do that. What, if, what, if, what, would, what would happens if something goes wrong? That's interesting. Wow. <laughs> I, would, I was yeah. saying the same thing yeah. that, that other people said. And then I went to a few births and fortunately they were beautiful. And that, that, that made it easy. If the first birth I went to had been a, you know, a full on disaster, I'm not sure what where I'd be today, mm. but it wasn't. And neither was the second or the third or the 10th or the 20th or the 30th or the 40th or the yeah. 50th. Mm -hmm. So um, it's been going on. I'm, I'm almost up to 400 home births myself with, uh, with nearly a hundred sets of twins and about 90 sets of breaches or maybe about 90 and 90. So but almost 45% of all my births are breaches and twins. Mm -hmm. That's amazing. And it really should be about what? 5%. Yeah. So you can see uh, I'm sort of a lightning rod for that because people have so few choices. Right. Yeah. That's amazing. But that was the epiphany. They, they forced it upon me. And I, and it's the best thing that ever happened. Put it that way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There are 400 plus families. Very, very grateful for that. <laughs> there are, there are people that have had the same thing happen to them. My friend, Brad Boots Taylor in Atlanta. Very yep. familiar. He was Paul. our backup. Oh yeah. Of yeah. course. You mm -hmm. know, Brad. And my friend, um, Paul Thomas, in, in, uh, he's a pediatrician in Oregon who wrote the vaccine-friendly plan with my friend, Jen Margulies. They both had their, you know, their license or their privileges yanked for no particular yeah. reason. And they both said the same thing. It's been liberating. Mm. They've oh, been wow. able to do things that they would never do. They can say things that are no, no longer under the thumb. I can go online and I can say things like, I think hydroxychloroquine was, was, is a good drug. It should have been used before they had other therapeutics to use it. And I'm not going to get my hospital telling me to shut up. Yeah. Yeah. Like Simone Gold did. Simone Gold, who founded America's Frontline Doctors, um, she was an ER physician here in Los Angeles and she was prescribing hydroxychloroquine for some clients and having good results. And the hospital fired her. Wow. For doing it. So I don't have to re answer to them anymore. Mm -hmm. So that's 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 a long answer to the very short question, but that's my answer. Gotcha. The next couple of questions are specific to these people. So they're kind of asking about their circumstance. So any feedback you have to offer on it. Um, the first one is. Let me preface, that by, let me preface yeah. that by saying that that it is my policy never to give specific medical advice to people that I've not taken their history and done an exam on. So I can speak in generalities because I don't think it's ethical or honest medicine to be telling people 
you know, they'll ask me a simple question about something. It's like, I can't answer that. Yeah. I don't know anything about you. Yeah. Yes. Very clear. Um, Understood. Yeah. Okay. So what do I do if I want a home birth, but it's not an option, meaning no close home, no close midwives, or they won't travel to me? What would I do? I would get an Airbnb and I would move mm. That's a great answer. to where, to where you can have the birth that you want. Mm -hmm. There's nothing, nothing in, in your life will be more important to you other than possibly your, your wedding day than the birth of your children. Mm -hmm. So you should plan for that. Like you plan for your wedding. I don't know if you've heard Bliss's beautiful analogy about weddings and birth. Have you guys heard that? I haven't heard it, no. Not specifically, no. Okay, well, I'll, I'll do it real briefly because I think it'll make a point for this for this listener. Yeah. You know, when when you uh, when you have a wedding, you plan everything. Decide who you want to invite. You, it's very, um, you spend a lot of time and a lot of money doing it. Yes. Okay. When you're pregnant, you take out your, Medica your Medicaid card or your Blue Shield card or whatever else, and you go to the hospital. Same person that's been doing your pap for 10 years. Oh, I guess this person's going to deliver my baby. And you don't do any research into it. You don't look anything into it whatsoever. Well, the two most important things in your life are a wedding and the birth of your children. I mean, there are other things, but let's just sure. or just give me that for the moment. So what would happen if we had something called wedding insurance? And you started paying wedding insurance when you're 20 and you paid $100 a month. And when you're 29 or 32 and you decide to get pregnant, your wedding is covered. But you don't get to pick which food you want to have and you don't get to pick which venue it is. And they invite people to your wedding that you don't like. <laughs> and, you know, no one in their right mind would ever go for something like that. Nope. No. And yet for the birth of your baby, you'll do that without even thinking about it. Yeah, yeah. So my advice to people who are feeling pressured in their own community or they feel like they're 36 weeks and it's too late to change practitioners, no, it's not. It's not too late to change practitioners. It's not too late to, to find somebody. And if you live, unfortunately, in a community or a state that, you know, that slams midwifery and doesn't allow these sorts of things or makes it illegal for anyone to help you, um, then look at the options. I'm not saying come to Southern California, but I have people coming here all the time for breaches or twins from other states who can't find support. But, um, but you know, tra travel 100 miles, travel 200 miles. Get it 36, 37 weeks or whatever. Even if it's, even if you, if it's only a few hundred miles, you can do that drive and labor, especially if it's your first baby. Mm -hmm. um, but if it's not, or if you find, if you find somebody that you really like, that's in Oregon and you live in Georgia. So, you know, get an Airbnb in Oregon and go out there at 36 weeks, take your other toddler with you or your, and your, your whatever, and, and, and make it an adventure that you will remember for the rest of your life. Heck right? yeah. Do not settle because logistics or insurance. If you spend five thousand, ten thousand, fifteen thousand dollars on your birth, it may be a big burden initially, but two years, three years from now, that money will mean nothing. Completely it will mean agree. nothing. Yeah. You'll pay it off and you'll wonder why why was I so stingy about it? Mm, yeah. How many people that you guys have probably interviewed who have, you know, seek out a home birth for their second birth do so because they had a traumatic home really yeah, first one. You know, traumatic or dissatisfying experience with their first birth yeah. in the hospital absolutely it's majority i would say yeah yeah so that is a really great kind of almost answering this question it says what do you suggest if i'm pregnant with twins and no one will support a home birth sounds like a ticket to california <laughs> for yeah. me that's what I would do. Yeah, or a state, or a state where midwives yes. there are midwives that do twins, and there are there are several. I think, yeah. you know, I think Tennessee still does. I think the farm still does twins. Mm. Uh, I know that there's a Cynthia Calais in Wisconsin does twins. I don't know what the laws are in any state. Unfortunately, I'm not up to date on the laws in any state but my own, mm -hmm. so I can't really answer the question. But yes, yeah. yes. Because if you go to the hospital, there's probably a 90% chance or more that you're going to end up with a C-section. You know, even if they tell you and you, you go in with the, that they'll deliver you vaginally, they'll be uh, often the bait and switch. Oh, baby turned a little yeah. bit, or the baby's not this, or baby's not that. And, you know, I think the C-section is the safest route. And then, and then what are you going to do? Now you're in labor and you, you really can't change at that point. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. yeah, same answer. <laughs> 
With the hands-off approach, what does the second stage look like in most of the labors you attend? Oh, we we we, are, we only use coach pushing when when the woman is struggling or she asks for help. Otherwise, mm-hmm. it's sort of uh, we let babies labor down, especially breeches. Mm-hmm. Uh, we let babies labor down until they can't resist pushing. And if, you know, it's not, and we don't really know people are complete most of the time because by exam, because we don't examine them. Right. So we know people are complete by the sounds that they make, the guttural sound that the, that makes when they they can't resist pushing. And then at some point, maybe we'll do an exam just to be sure they don't have an anterior lip or that they're they're that they're completely dilated. Mm-hmm. And then we let them do their thing. And sometimes it's coach pushing because they're just they just can't get the mechanics down. But it, you know, and they're in water a lot of times. They're on all fours. They're able to sit on a ball. Sometimes people like to push or sit on the toilet when they're pushing. We let them go wherever and do whatever they want. So it isn't on your back, fingers in your vagina, massaging your perineum and telling you when to push and counting to 10 and blowing it out. And we, that's extremely rare. It does happen on occasion when guided pushing is necessary, but most of the time it's not. Mm-hmm. And as Bliss likes to say, my co-host, she likes to say um, that everything that we do is an intervention. Mm-hmm. Nobody else does these sorts of things to animals in the wild. Yeah. The other cows don't come over and start coaching them how to push when, <laughs> when, the, when it's time to push. And she has a funny statement. She says, you know, that all these badge exams that people do, she says, when was the last time anyone checked a tiger at seven centimeters? <laughs> yeah. Which yeah. I love. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> so how do we know the tiger's ready to get to, to, to push? They, they, we just do. Yeah. yeah. And that's, again, it gets back to my initial statement. That the whole model needs to change to understand that pregnancy is an innate power and ability of a woman's body. And it, and it doesn't need to be treated. And the medical model always thinks that it needs to be treated. Mm-hmm. All right. That's why we call you clients. They call you patients. Right. Patients even implies they put you in a hospital gown. You can't wear your own jammies. Yeah. Why can't I wear my own jammies? Okay. Mm-hmm. Well, I don't know. You can't. Right. They, they don't even have a reason. Why does the baby go to the warmer? Well, it has to be, we have to look at the baby. It's like, well, look at it over here. Yeah. yeah. Well, we have yeah. to dry it off. Well, no, you don't, but dry it off over here. Mm-hmm. Well, we have to give it a shot. Not 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 a, not in my life are you going to do that. Yeah. You know, so why do they take the baby to the warmer? And I did that for 30 years, 25 years. I cut the cord, show the mother of the baby, and I hand the baby to the nurse over at the warmer. Why would I do that? I, you know, if I only do then what I know now, but that's, of course, life. That's what life is. That's why I'm trying to spread, and you guys too, the wisdom that you acquire, people need to people need to listen to it and not ignore it. Yeah, mm-hmm. they can then decide whether it's not a wisdom they want to uh, incorporate into their plan or not. But at least listen. Yeah, don't label us as being crazy or cowboys or disinformation. I've been called every you know every pejorative in the book, and I know I'm hitting the right spot when I'm when you start to upset people when they start to uh, you know troll you or whatever. You you know you're you know you're that's where you want to be. Yeah. Nobody yeah. did it. And nobody ever did anything great by not being beaten up and rough, ruffling feathers. Right. That's the way it works. Yeah. And it, it also speaks to your earlier point of just being open to different ideas instead of just completely shutting things down and, and demonizing the person who's you know, sharing the, the other idea. So that if, if someone, if, if a mom to be gets in a conversation and all she's thinking about is, you know, c-sections and you know hospitals and this and that and somebody offers an alternative idea it's like just listen it doesn't yeah. to your point you don't have to choose it but you want to at least take in the, this information and the wisdom so that you can make that informed decision absolutely matthew i think that yeah that i won't even add to that there's nothing to add to that we don't expect people to take our advice and do it we expect people to we want people to listen and make their own decisions and if they yeah. choose that they think the hospital is a better model for whatever reason, whether it's fear or, or, or economics or whatever reason they have, we respect that Mm -hmm. because everybody has a different life experience and it's impossible to project. And we should never be doing this. And your mother and your mother-in-law and your girlfriends should not be doing this to, to you either. Yeah. Yeah. 
Okay. A couple more questions. In your research mm-hmm. and personal experience about what percentage of vaginal breach births require manual intervention by the provider to get baby out? Um, well, it's changing for me. I mean, I used to do all breaches on people uh, with women on their back uh, in lithotomy position. That's how I learned to do it. So only in the last five or six years has upright breach sort of come back as, as favor. So when a woman's on her back, you almost always have to do some manipulation gotcha. because you don't have gravity and the natural flexing of the head that occurs when the baby's hanging on all fours. So when women are on their back, hands on is, I mean, you don't, you can let the baby come out to a certain point, but then usually one shoulder you'll sweep, the other shoulder you'll sweep, and then you just do your little Marcel smelly bite maneuver and you get the head out. So I would say a high percentage of people on their back and maybe 20% of people on their all fours. And baby will tell you exactly if it's necessary or not mm. by a couple of things. One is once the baby reaches the umbilicus, we don't touch anything. Sometimes you put a little warm compress on the perineum to protect the perineum. But other than that, we don't really try to touch the baby. When the baby reaches the umbilicus, we usually like to see the head out within three to five minutes. And three to five minutes can seem like an eternity. So it's a really long time. So it's hard sometimes to sit there and watch a baby hanging halfway out, but you don't need to do anything. As long as the back begins to rotate toward the sacrum, what we call call, um, the baby rotates the sacrum anterior or the baby's tum rotates to mom's bum, tum to bum. And when babies rotate like that, that tells you that both arms are in front of the chest and will come out on their own. When they don't rotate, it usually implies that either one or both arms are behind the head. And that a baby's elbow or stuff is often usually getting stuck on the symphys- mother's symphysis, and it will not come out unless you go up and sweep it down and out. Mm. So I would say that in, in babies that have been properly selected ahead of time, which is almost all my breaches because I meet them ahead of time, that when they're on all fours positioning, helping them is probably one or two, you know, one or two out of five, gotcha. 20, 30% of the time. That's fascinating. That's and again, that's just a, a number I cooked up. I yeah, don't think yeah, yeah. I don't have any data to back that up. Gotcha. Okay. I we addressed this a bit in the first half of our conversation, but if you have anything to add to this, how can we make community-based midwifery care more accessible and mainstream here in the States, especially when medical providers can be very patronizing towards both CPMs and CNMs? <laughs> it's a very, very difficult thing to do. All right. Their, their lobby is big and strong. Midwives have either no lobby or a tiny little lobby. Politicians don't know anything. All right. I don't mean that as, as a negative. They just don't know anything. All right. Most politicians are lawyers or businessmen. They don't know this stuff. So they take their advice from who? From the people with the biggest lobby. Who pay who give the most campaign contributions <laughs> and, and that's the california in my state that's the california medical association and the american college of OBGYN. and they are going to they are an industrial lobby for their profession and their lobby their job is not to do what's best for the women of california their job is to do what's best for their members yeah. and often their members are more the, the people in academia and and uh, big med- big in medicine, like the big foundations like Kaiser and, and those sorts of things, as opposed to the small practitioners, we don't really have any representation either. So it's gonna be very hard to do it that way. It's gonna to have to come from rallies and pressure and people running for office who have this as part of their mission. And the problem of course is that the passion that most women feel for this is when they're pregnant or having a baby. Mm. And then after that, who has time? Yeah. Mm, yeah. Who has time to become, you know, a lobbyist or an activist or an advocate for birth choices? I mean, you get small people, but you can't compete with the money that big medicine has. So it's going to be very difficult to get laws changed in certain states. And when they do, the medical lobby usually will exact its pound of flesh anyway, like what happened in 2014 here in California, where licensed midwives got autonomy. They didn't need supervision anymore. But in, but for that, they had to exchange breaches, twins, 
anything under 37 weeks, anything over 42 weeks. Hmm. The idea that a midwife now in California has to abandon her client if she's not in labor at 41 weeks uh, at midnight on the 42nd week day, whatever that is, um, or that if she's in labor at 36 weeks and five days that she now has to abandon that client is so stupid. Yeah, yeah that's crazy. By the way, one of my major tenants I will... I want your listeners to know because they don't listen to me regularly. Is it anybody time, anytime somebody espouses a perfectly even number for something, they're lying. So in other words, 37 weeks is a lie. 42 yeah. weeks is a lie. Six feet apart is a lie. Uh, age 35 is a lie. 24 hours of ruptured membranes is a lie. Yeah. You know, these are, nature doesn't work that way. Right. Nature doesn't work with perfect numbers. So they're just rounding things. Even when I gave you, I even prefaced the numbers when I gave you the one in 2000, the one in 500, I said that this is like, you know, I'm, I'm rounding because I want to be accurate that that's not how nature works. So when they pass a law that says a, a woman who's 42 weeks has to not be delivered by a midwife, why? Yeah. Midwives are quite capable of assessing a baby's well-being. They're quite capable of doing, uh, ordering biophysical profiles and NSTs um, if they even need to. The standard is to do them at 42 weeks, so fine, we do them, but there may be reasons not to do them either, but I don't want to be that radical, so let's just stay within those boundaries. But if the testing at 41 weeks and six days shows a biophysical profile of 10 out of 10, then the, the likelihood that anything's going to happen bad to that baby for the next three to four days is less than 1%. Mm -hmm. So why do they have to abandon their client? Yeah. Is that good medicine? Is that what's best for the women of California? No. They just, they just did it because they think that they're the only arbiters of safety and that obviously midwives and, and women who are pregnant don't know anything and don't care about the safety of their babies. The same thing happens in the hospital. You'll see that the hospital thinks of your baby as their baby when you give birth in a hospital mm -hmm. and because um, they don't think that you're competent, right? Mm -hmm. They don't. And it's not because they're not good people. It's because the system morphs them into robotic people. Because all these people are loving, caring people on their own. Not all of them. I guess there's there's jerks everywhere, but for the most part, they're all great people. But it but the system makes them into bad people. Nobody goes to, you know, people go to law school, they go, they go, they go, they're idealistic, they go to law school, they come out and they become creepy lawyers. All right. How does that happen? <laughs> They're, they're good people. It's the same thing with politicians. A lot of people go to Washington with great intentions and they leave 25 years later, multimillionaires and never got anything done. Yeah. They, you know, sometimes the system beats them up and that's what happens in a hospital setting. Okay. Yes. Did yeah. I answer just, that question? Yeah. You did. You did. And it just, again, it makes me think of, of the people who have been, the patients in that system who then come out espousing the things that the system has kind of dropped on them. Like the people who told us that, you know, we, we are irresponsible and you must not care about your baby because you're choosing home birth. Yeah. And you know, that, that, those are the things that, that can get me triggered for <laughs> sure. And so, um, it, it's just, it really is interesting to hear so much from your experience mm -hmm. and, and your perspective of, you know, what you've seen being in the hospital, being outside the hospital, and just the, the proximity that you have had to that system. Um, I just find it, I just find it fascinating. So I don't have any other yeah, points to, to say other than you that. You have to but... compartmentalize your issues. Otherwise you blow your brains out and you'd go crazy. <laughs> yeah, right. It's just... <laughs> yeah. Like, my, like my own family members, uh, uh, you know, my niece, her first baby was breached. She knows what I do. She chose to have an elective C-section. Perfectly fine. We had a good talk and that's what she chose. My other niece had her third baby so quickly that it was born on the bathroom floor at home. But they still, you know, they, they didn't, you know, they called an ambulance, the ambulance, they, they went to the hospital afterwards and that's what they do because, you know, they don't know a midwife or anything like that, but she yeah. just had her fourth baby yesterday. Congratulations, Aaron and Dan. Oh. Um, but um, they chose to do it in the hospital. Despite the fact that her last baby was born on the floor at home and that knowing what I do, because that's their, their model of care that they feel most comfortable with. Mm -hmm. And they are different because they know there's an alternative model and they still chose that. 
hundred percent fine with that. Mm -hmm. That's that's great. What I'm not fine with is people being not told that there's alternatives or yeah. being told the alternatives are crazy and only cowboys do that. Sort yeah. Of thing. yeah, 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 yeah. We get that. Okay. Final question: How can we as individuals change the conversations around birth? Well, I think that most women who are pregnant should should always, always, always look at midwifery. Um, I think that we'll have better outcomes when that's that's done. And I think that if the next generation of people sees more people going to midwives and will only continue to snowball, I think that um, we as midwives and as, as practitioners in the home birth, we need to not do to the hospital birthing people what they do to us. We need to stay the, maintain the higher road. Mm. It's not, it's not inappropriate to bad mouth or, or what, even on my podcast, I have a segment that I use sometimes I call it the dumb doctor dogma segment. And I'll read something that was really stupid that the doctor did, but it's not to insult. I don't use names usually, but it's, it's not, it's just to point out some of the dumb things that happen, but not to, not to belittle and ridicule and uh, uh, try to discourage people from choosing that option. We want them to have all options. And I think that hiring a doula is something that people can, can do to advocate for them in the hospital model. Um, but ultimately, it, it, we need to get normal birthing out of the hospital. And the only way to get normal birthing out of the hospital is to create an alternative to the hospital for birthing that isn't just the home. Because right. I don't think that you're ever going to find a majority of people feeling safe in the home. But we need to find a place that's sort of in between. And I'm not talking about a hospital attached birthing center because that's going to be something that is just going to follow the hospital rules and guidelines. Mm -hmm. It's going to be, have to be a new model. And the example I sometimes use for this is that when I was a kid growing up, food was just food. And you went to the market and tomatoes were tomatoes and maybe there were three kinds of tomatoes and that was it. Okay. And there were, and you had born in, there was no such thing as organic. There was no such right. thing as like hybrid or GMO or all that. Food was just food. And then the, the food industry changed. And why did it change? It changed because something called whole foods came along, I believe, and changed the way we shop for food. And then, you know, we had other markets that came along too. They, they came, they came where you could buy a beautiful lunch at your grocery store, you could, their organic food, they had health food, they had healthy stuff, you know, and so what happened now is Ralph's and Bonds, and I don't know what the markets are in Atlanta, the, the, the big chain ones, Kroger's, whatever they are, mm -hmm. um, they all, they all change, they all now have a place where you can buy a nice nour nourishing lunch, and yeah. they all have a, they all have an organic section, mm -hmm. and they have a, you know, organic, organic fruit section, are you really getting organic fruit, I don't know, are you really <laughs> getting pesticide free fruit, I don't know, I mean, do do insects know boundaries? Do insects not fly from the from the farm with the roundup <laughs> to the farm without the roundup? I mean, I don't know. I mean, <laughs> so I don't know if we're, but but it, it changed the way we did things. Mm -hmm. Just as as Starbucks or McDonald's changed the way we got food. And what else in, in the medical world, what changed surgery in the hospital, which was cumbersome and your cases were delayed and they were always bumped for emergencies and so like was these guys created things called surgery centers, freestanding surgery centers. And they ran on time and they were efficient and they were easy for the client to get in and client to get out and parking was free and blah. And they ran these surgery centers and they took the, the, all the um, minor surgeries and the money-making things from the hospital and they started to go to these private surgery centers. And some, some of the times they were so lucrative that certain doctors like plastic surgeon, whatever, or had their own operating room in their own office because they found a way to, to do that. So what did hospitals have to do? Hospitals had to compete with that. So hospitals began forming their own sort of surgery centers. Eventually they just bought up all the surgery centers. And so now they own the surgery centers, but it changed surgery mm -hmm. from this cumbersome thing coming in the night before, not eating all night long, you know, um, having your 7.30 case starting at 20 minutes after eight. And then your whole day is screwed up because everything is pushed back and bumped and the hospital not caring because they're the hospital and you have a private office and all your patients are, you know, are moved. They didn't care. So there was competition. 
what we, what we need in obstetrics is competition with the hospital model. And if I were the chief financial officer of a hospital, I don't know why they, they're so recalcitrant to the idea of forming a breach center or a twin center. I mean, in Los Angeles, my God, you know, in Los Angeles County alone, there's about 120,000 births a year. That, that means there's over 4,000 breach births a year. All right. If you could get 10% of those, that's 400 breaches. That's over 30 a month mm -hmm. at your institution. Think about how much you could teach. Yeah. If you've got residents that spent two months with you and you're doing 30 a month and they were on half the time, they could see 15 breaches a month. They'd see 30 in two months. Wow. They would be quite comfortable doing breaches, but you'll never be comfortable when, when the only breaches they're seeing are coming out by cesarean section. Sure. Or we need somebody like, and excuse me for referring to these people because I don't like them, but somebody like George Soros or Bill Gates or Bezos or somebody who's got billions and billions of dollars to decide, you know what? Rather than putting it into the things they're putting it into, and I'll <laughs> avoid anything else about that, why not putting it into the one, the most important thing that our country could possibly do, at least from a medical standpoint, and that's make it make birth better right. by by starting a new system of how we give birth, having a new institution, having birthing facilities. Don't call them birth centers. Don't call them hospitals because that's that those connotations are already taken mm -hmm. yeah yeah but you come up with a clever idea and you and you and you franchise it mm -hmm. you'll open one if you want to open one in seattle open one in san francisco open one in los angeles start there and see how it works mm -hmm. have an operating room in it right but let yeah. women come there with all their stuff yeah their roll their roller balls and their their rebozos and their mm -hmm. you know all that stuff and they bring their stuff with them and they can go in a room and they can labor by themselves with their birth team and you don't necessarily have to have privileges there that they can bring any midwife they want there with them or they can do some credentialing fine but once you start down that credentialing road then you start down all the things yeah, that, that turn it that turn it into a hospital yeah mm -hmm. yeah um, will happen so you know you have to keep lawyers out of the picture because risk managers, their goal is not the same goal as those of the practitioners and the patients or the clients. Their goal is, I always say this, is to have a baby in the bassinet. Yep. How it gets in the bassinet, a crying baby in the bassinet, how it gets there is not their concern. And what happens to that baby later and what happens to that mother now or what happens to that mother in the future and all her future babies is not their concern. Right. All their concern is, is avoiding the liability on this one baby and so how it gets there is that thing. And so you've got to get those kind of people with that kind of mind and not let them through the door. You know, have a big red circle with a line through it going through, <laughs> you know, whatever you want and not let those people come in. Yeah. You know? mm -hmm. It's the same thing that we see with the pandemic right now where virologists and epidemiologists have one thing to, to do. They want to prevent death. Mm -hmm. So all the collateral damage from lockdowns and vaccines pro or con or the rushing to do these sorts of things, whether you like them or not, and all the things that they're doing, and maybe the deaths from suicide and the deaths from drug overdose and the deaths from loneliness and the, having old people dying without ever seeing their family members or touching their grandchildren or, or whatever, all that's, that's collateral damage, doesn't matter to them. Yeah. All that matters is we keep deaths at the lowest point. It's the same sort of thinking that we have in obstetrics in the medical model. And that's why to come full circle, the medical model needs to be put in the trash heap of history and we need a new model for care, but it's going to take a monumental effort and it's going to take money mm -hmm. and it's going to take somebody who, you know, I doesn't Bill Gates have kids. Right. I mean, maybe he didn't think, maybe that he thought the experience was great. I mean, yeah. I, you know, I, somebody well, really wealthy got to have kids who had a bad experience in the hospital it has to happen. Mm -hmm. So maybe that, maybe it will happen. Maybe you putting this out in the ether will cause ripples. Everything that we do, you and I, causes ripples. Everything everybody Absolutely. does causes ripples. Absolutely. But this is going to cause a ripple. And maybe it'll fall in the ears of somebody else who says, yeah, I know somebody who knows somebody who knows somebody. And then they'll reach out to uh, the Doing It At Home podcast and and uh, you'll get them on. Then, or I'll get them on mine. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. And uh, we'll, we'll see if we can't get something started. I mean, this is how movements start. This is how it things is. change. It, but it has to change because we're doing so poorly. Yeah. yeah. And I look at other countries like Brazil or South Africa, and 80% of the women there are getting a C-section. They're being told that it's fashionable and that anybody who goes into labor is because they're, they're lower social economic class. Yeah. And the classy women don't have it and that sort of thing. I mean, it's... That's wild. It's again, it's the, it's, I don't even think it's the end point there. I don't, I don't know whether that's money or idiocy or what, but there's, but you're messing with mother nature. And every time you do, there's ripples. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. Right. Well, we appreciate so much everything that you do to so create grateful. some, you know, to, to put things out there and just the, the conversations that you're willing to have and just being so bold with it. And, you know, we love that you came on the show and just were, just let it rip. Because people who are listening to this right now, I mean, I know that, that they've been impacted in powerful ways. So uh, we're happy to be continuing to put some ripples out there with you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I, again, I'm, I'm able to say what I'm able to say because I am in the situation I'm in. Like I said, I don't yeah. answer to an insurance company. I don't answer to a hospital staff. I don't have partners that would want to rein me in. Um, like we have, we have, um, doctors here who would like to back midwives up and take their transports, but their partners won't let them. Wow. Right. And they have to get along with their partners. So yeah, I'm free to do these sorts of things and I'm going to continue to do them until, well, until I can't do it anymore. And even, you know, if should, should uh, some licensing board or whatever else decide that they don't want me to do it anymore, I would fight them tooth and nail and I would be very vocal about it. And if my attorney had said to be quiet, I would say, um, no, <laughs> uh, because what do I have to lose at this point? I mean, I'm 65 yeah. years old. I plan to practice for until I can't anymore. But if that disappears, then it will just make me into something stronger. It's like Obi-Wan Kenobi. <laughs> Strike me down, Luke, and I'll become stronger than, I, than anything you can imagine. No, it's, yeah, you're it's talking our language. language. <laughs> yeah. What's that? You speak in this man's language right here. He's, he gets you know it. what I'm talking about. Oh, right? absolutely. absolutely. I, I'm not asking for trouble, but I'm, but I'm, but I'm, I'm speaking truth. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And right now truth is under attack Yeah. in our country, more so than anything I've ever seen in my 65 years mm -hmm. uh, where truth is considered misinformation. Mm, yeah. And misinformation is considered truth. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it, Orwell could never have imagined this, could not have imagined what's going on. And it's happening. It's been happening in our profession for quite a while. Doctors saying things like you said earlier, like your pelvis is too small, your baby's too big. I mean, making stuff up. Mm -hmm. I've had people say that, you know, if you have a shoulder dystocia in one pregnancy, that you have a 50% chance of having it in your next pregnancy. And it's like, where does this data come from? Where do they, where, where are they making this stuff up? Mm -hmm. Or that twins need to be, oh, here's one that we didn't even get to. Twins need to be delivered by 37 weeks because the stillbirth rate is rising. Um, and if we go past... If you ask the doctor, well, what is the actual risk? They won't know. Mm. I guarantee you, 100%, they won't know. Mm -hmm. Okay, But I know, and if you want to dub this in, I can just briefly tell you that that... If you look at a lot of numbers, you'll find that the risk of stillbirth for twins at 36 to 37 weeks is about seven per hundred, uh, excuse me, seven per 10,000. And the risk at um, 40 weeks, which is as far as the data goes, is about 46 per 10,000. Wow. Okay. So there's always a rise in stillbirth the longer you go on pregnancy. That's true of any pregnancy, singleton, twins, whatever breach. That's true. But 46 per 10,000 is about seven times greater than seven per 10,000, right? Okay. But the chance of it not happening, here we go again, Yeah. is 99.93% chance of it not happening at 36 to 37 weeks and 99.54% chance of it not happening at 40 weeks. Mm -hmm. So it's less than one in 200 chance that it's going to happen at 40 weeks. And yet we have doctors telling people that we need to induce you at 37 weeks because the risk of stillbirth is so high. Yeah. How do you explain that? It's ignorance. Mm -hmm. It's yeah. ignorance, fear, ruling them. And it's not honoring the informed consent model. Yeah. Some people may think one in 200 is way too high and I don't wanna take that risk. 
other people think one in 200, I have to be induced. And what's the risk of being induced? And what's my likelihood of ending up with a fetal distress and a cesarean section because I'm induced when my babies aren't ready and my babies will end up in the NICU? So like that, these things aren't considered. The only thing that's considered is babies in the bassinet. What happens after that is not considered. Yeah. This is how I've determined, you know, again, I'm not saying the individual doctor thinks this way, but this is how the system thinks. Right. And the system is bigger than everything. It's this, it's this blob. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's this blob that eats everything. Right. We are holding so. space to uh, minimize that blob <laughs> through all of our collective efforts and everything that we're doing. And uh, again, just to reiterate how grateful we are to have you here in our space. We had so many of our community members excited to have you. You've been referenced in many a podcast. We've had some of your clients on the podcast. So this feels very you know, fulfilling on, on our end and is a, a beautiful addition and value add to the doing it at home space. And I want to make sure that I send uh, everyone in, in when they want to find you. So listen to the podcast, look at your resources, follow you on social media. So uh, we are going to put links links to all of that in the show description. And when we share this episode, we're going to put that out there as well so that others, like you said, the the three maybe who didn't know who you were <laughs> will now. Shame on them. <laughs> <laughs> well, Dr. Sue, this has been super enlightening. Yeah. Thank you so much for joining us on the show. You're welcome, guys. Thanks for having me. Quick note about the Doing It at Home podcast. Matthew and I are not doctors or medical professionals, and nothing we say should be taken as medical advice or opinion. If you have medical or health-related questions, please take them to a trained professional. We're here simply to entertain you with stories and conversations about pregnancy, birth, and parenthood.